I'm pleased to announce the publication of this research handbook on international solidarity and the law. This volume has contributed to articulating an understanding of international solidarity as an emancipatory norm that recognizes the right to call for recognition of the human rights of vulnerable individuals and groups across borders, as well as the concurrent duty to recognize and respect them. It incorporates the freedoms of expression and association and the rights to equality and non-discrimination. It is the recognition of the responsibility of humanity to protect those most vulnerable to exclusion, discrimination, or marginalization, precisely in recognition of their human dignity. International solidarity is deeply rooted in the legal and political instruments, as well as the cross-cultural worldviews of all regional systems and societies, many national constitutions, and the output of both the UN General Assembly and the UN Human Rights Council. The current trend towards multipolarity requires open dialogue to promote trust and mutual understanding between pluralistic peoples in order to acknowledge a shared independent interest in cooperating to protect common goods and confront common global threats. As stated in her chapter by Shyami Puvamanangshi, international solidarity provides an impetus for collective responses to interconnected challenges in an interdependent world. It underlies the very idea of the United Nations and permeates the three interlinked pillars of the UN Charter, peace and security, development, and human rights. And she calls for the construction of an overarching international solidarity to tackle a range of global challenges, including poverty and inequality through debt relief and technology transfer for low and middle income developing countries, prevention of global health crises through equitable access to vaccines, and the urgency of addressing global natural resource management, climate change and environmental conservation for intergenerational sustainable development. She suggests that international solidarity must be a normative bridge connecting the world's peoples to advance a just and equitable international order for all. She underscores a framework of North-South, but South-South and triangular solidarity as well. In the next chapters by Obifor Okafor and Miyawe, they call for an open-minded, globally sensitive and universally relevant notion of solidarity. They point out that the flexibility of the solidarity concept should not be considered a weakness. Instead, they suggest that it's similar to many norms within human rights law that are subject to variance in national and regional articulation and interpretation. It may be argued that the concept of solidarity need not be uniform, but it can still retain a universal quality as it's practiced in a variety of transnational contexts. In my own chapter, I warn of the risk of the dominance of a securitized sol solidarity as a result of the war in Ukraine, and I explain the need to address the polarization marked by competing solidarities. I provide an overview of the historical peace and solidarity civil society movements that underscore the importance of guaranteeing spaces for transnational communication and organization. And I suggest that there's much to be learned from transitional justice in order to promote a pro homine intergenerational cross-cultural peace and solidarity approach. Now, Mihir Kanele's chapter, he explains the importance of recognizing the shared qualities of individual and collective rights of peoples to development and to international solidarity as components of a human rights enabling social and international order that will recognize collective claims to land natural resources, traditional knowledge, etc. And the recognition of collective rights holders is actually grounded in the African Charter of Human and People's Rights. So he opines that solidarity may be considered the foundational principle for the duty of states to cooperate with each other and with non-state actors to tackle common concerns of humankind by taking human rights-based collective action in global or regional partnerships and refraining from adopting national policies that impair or nullify the right to development or the right to international solidarity of people in external jurisdictions. 
So Canada characterizes the right to development and the right to international solidarity as making the human rights project more complete and more balanced. This is followed by a chapter by Ulla Christian Falkold, where he considers international solidarity in the context of anti-corruption. He says it should be based on the principles that investor states should not act in their self-interest in taking measures, hence they actually should return assets to host countries, and they should refrain from intervening in the internal affairs of the host states. He identifies states and their populations receiving foreign direct investment as rights holders and those with low levels of development as needing international solidarity. He characterizes investor home states as duty bearers with an obligation to prevent and also to repair corruption. However, those investing in countries with weak national mechanisms to prosecute corruption also need international solidarity. So he shows that the implementation of the UN Convention Against Corruption has not contributed to international solidarity due to the insufficient focus on the economic, social, and cultural rights and the right to development of the victimized societies, as well as the lack of commitment to asset recovery. So many rights holders nations are unable to file requests for asset recovery. And so this chapter highlights the importance of analyzing global challenges through a holistic solidarity framework that recognizes the interlinkage of human rights with other fields. And this would then require a combination of UN jurisdictions, Geneva, which addresses human rights, New York, which is peace and security, and Vienna, which looks at transnational crime. And this chapter then is followed by Harrison Mabori. He's writing about Bandung solidarity as a transnational decolonial solidarity within international trade. And this aims for a broader economic justice to ensure protection of everyone's dignity, humanity, and the environment. And this would stand in contestation to Bretton Woods solidarity, which promotes free trade with a focus on economic development in a framework of sovereign inequalities. He calls for closing the gap between these competing solidarities, in part through greater participation for representatives of the South in forums creating trade standards and recognition of the central relevance of the context in which they are applied and their impact on human rights. And this chapter is then followed by Beata Schofiel. In her chapter, she's arguing that international solidarity is an integral part of sustainability. So she's calling for including intersectional, um, intergenerational, interspecies even, unbound by geopolitical borders, characteristics within the international legal principle of solidarity. So she suggests that achieving sustainability would secure social foundations for people, including future generations, and protect nature. Schofield calls for recognition of planetary boundaries as a relevant concept of international solidarity. And she identifies corporations as engaging in anti-solidarity practices, such as negative environmental, social, economic, and governance impacts across global value chains, including corruption, and gender gendered and racialized oppression. So in particular, she's concerned about the need to safeguard indigenous people's right to restitution of property, which they have been dispossessed from. And um, Schofield suggests that host states across global value chains could be included in regulatory discussions on corporate due diligence, echoing Mubori's call for an inclusive uh, participation from the South. This chapter is then followed by Obi Aginam's chapter, which is looking at international solidarity within the context of global health emergencies. And he's pointing to regionalism as a framework to measure implementation. He points out that solidarity is codified in the constituent instruments establishing most regional integration organizations from Europe to the Americas to Africa and the vast Asia-Pacific region. And he notes that regional human rights instruments recognize the right to health and that there's a solidarity orientation towards personhood at the regional level. But he juxtaposes the success of the EU taking medical countermeasures to manage COVID-19 with the failure of the African Union due to structural inequalities that impeded manufacturing. So he analyzes proposals to reinvent global health governance to implement international solidarity, underscoring the urgency of preventing future global pandemics. This chapter is then followed by a very strong chapter by Usha Natarjan. She's calling for recognition of emancipatory international solidarity in the context of climate change. And she considers climate change to be symptomatic of intensifying global systems of oppression 
and inequity. And she suggests that transnational solidarity movements are the only hope for hundreds of millions of peoples mired in poverty across the global south. She criticizes the criminalization of their organizations, their protests and movement building, as well as the fracturing and sabotaging of transnational alliances among environmental justice movements, indigenous and tribal organizations, peasant and small farmer associations, food sovereignty coalitions, etc. So she underscores the importance of applying an interconnected, interdependent solidarity that relates to the environment, the deep sea, and outer space. And she points out that environmental justice movements often work in solidarity with present and future generations in accordance with the prevailing definition of sustainable development, thereby helping to broaden the conventional notions of solidarity. And she characterizes these movements as pursuing transversal identity, hybridity, solidarity, as opposed to universalism in order to pursue a more genuine international law. And this chapter then is followed by a chapter by Amy Chin Arroyo and Jaya Ramji Nogales. And they're discussing the contribution of civil society solidarity movements in the context of migration. So they identify two opposing types of solidarity, positive solidarity that enhances the welfare of migrants, but also negative solidarity that seeks to exclude migrants, exacerbating their vulnerability to a range of forms of violence. And Chin Arroyo and Ramji Nogales describe the application of anti-solidarity border control measures by the EU and the United States to criminalize humanitarian actors who help migrants, as well as the drafting of a new pact on migration and asylum that pursue negative solidarity. So they suggest that international law should build institutions that support a culture of solidarity, solidarity that would promote positive solidarity. And because migrants are often deprived of their rights, Chin Arroyo and Ramji Nugales call for a reorientation of the protection perspective to focus on the duties of plurality of actors. Um, their poignant presentation of the motivations of civil society actors in the global south who provide solidarity assistance to migrants inspire an imaginary of new strategies to promote a culture of solidarity, uh, which would include actually churches and universities. And this chapter then is followed by a chapter by Elizabeth Salmon, and she's explaining that solidarity is a principle in the constitutive il, um, instrument of the Organization of American States, as well as in the preamble of regional treaties. So she describes how it's referred to by the OAS as means to combat poverty and natural disasters and promote economic, social, and cultural rights, as well as development. She has indicates that within the region, they use solidarity to tackle health crises like COVID-19, but also to look at corruption issues and migration. And she describes American solidarity as including representative democracy and human rights. Um, the American Declaration actually calls for education on human uh, solidarity, and uh, Article 26 of the American Convention uh, calls for international cooperation among states to achieve economic, social, and cultural rights and progressive development, and this implies then solidarity. So she explains how the duty of cooperation is reiterated in several treaties, from preventing forced disappearances to combating discrimination and violence against women and racism. So she says that the Inter-American Commission interprets solidarity as applicable to relations between states and non-state actors and uh, between citizens from the same country. So she states that solidarity within the region is most often referred to as a duty as opposed to a right. And this chapter is followed by uh, another chapter by Abbas and Ahmed, and they're looking at the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, showing how it promotes soft peace mediation as a form of solidarity, and moreover, moreover they have a solidarity fund. Um, they explained how the concept of the Ummah, the community of the brotherhood, um, is pursued as a form of solidarity and the same within the Arab League. Um, the challenges within the region international solidarity include sectarianism, as we've seen, as well, and external threats such as Islamophobia. So they actually suggest that the, these regional organizations should implement international solidarity measures in order to retain their relevance for the, the Muslim masses around the world. Uh, Sylvia Bawa, in her chapter, presents two aspects of African humanism and philosophy that relate to solidarity. She refers to the principle of Ubuntu and Ferutuma, and she says that solidarity should address historical injustice 
relating to gender inequality. So for her, international solidarity is a form of social justice. And the right to development would then guarantee uh, re redistribution. In her chapter, she's looking at feminist foreign policies, and she critiques them because she says that they rely on dominant Western feminist frameworks that don't recognize the need for people's self-determination, nor address the power asymmetries in the international political economy. Really interesting, provocative chapter where uh, she's calling for international solidarity as a recognition of a duty. And her chapter is then complemented by John Mark East um, chapter where he's looking at solidarity as a principle of international law, which is also the foundational principle of the African Union. And he sets forth that it has internal and external dimensions. And the internal dimension then allows the region to manage interregional affairs. And the external uh, dimension allows um, the African Union to seek redress for economic inequalities among states and to call for reform of the international system to allow for more equal participation in the international legal order. So he is addressing um, historical crimes like slavery and colonization, but also looking at solidarity as a way to request support for humanitarian disasters, climate change, health emergencies, migration, democratization. And so uh, for him, solidarity is a core value of the African peoples, their culture, their institutions, and their societies, confirming the relevance of the Ubuntu worldview. And um, the challenges are placed by uh, a sort of a revival of status notions of solidarity that are promoted by post-colonial African states within the OAU um, that unfortunately are violating uh, human rights in a massive way and, and failing to deliver the type of development that the people expect. So um, he's calling for a more intra-people's version of solidarity that would be uh, respectful of human rights and would seek to um, resolve some of these situations of armed conflict and environmental degradation, disease and poverty affecting the region. He's very worried about xenophobia, and he's very worried about um, uh, the challenges uh, coming from external uh, regions within the area. So um, Basuki Nasaya presents a historic link between uh, solidarity and human rights, explaining how anti-colonial solidarity grounded standing at the International Court of Justice in self-determination claims. And in this chapter, she's looking at the right to solidarity as both an end goal and enabling legal framing of the collective legal personality of those who have been formally co colonized. So she gives a caveat that solidarity is not a neutral norm, but it gets political and legal meaning from the context in which it's invoked and the distributional questions at stake. So she's calling for promoting solidarity to examine the claims of communities who aspire for self-determination. Really, really provocative chapter when we think about the recent case uh, addressing Palestine at the ICJ. Um, in the next chapter, Ala Poznakova cites the intrinsic relationship between solidarity and law of the sea. And she's noting that the duty to rescue at sea is a binding customary obligation relating to solidarity. And she calls for a solidarity-based approach for equitable and sustainable use of ocean resources. Poznakova highlights the potential added value of recognition of a human rights-based solidarity that would be a universal and overarching principle of law that would contribute to the paradigm shift in the law of the sea, transforming it from what she calls a state-centric regime to an international legal order founded on international community interest. So she underscores the urgency of the current context because of the scarcity of oceans natural resources combined with pollution and biodiversity loss. And she underscores the interdependence of states and the need for a fresh new collective thinking and solidarity. So she's calling for clear, detailed legal norms to regulate collective conduct and resolve the tensions between competing solidarities such as distributive and intergenerational solidarity. And she takes inspiration from the negotiation of the UNCLOS, in which parties sought a more equitable access to marine resources for broad communities transcending sovereign states, developing and vulnerable states, non-independent peoples in the international community, including future generations of mankind. So she wants solidarity recognized within law. And this is followed by Catherine Benet's chapter, who's looking at natural and energy resources, describing them as common goods that require collaboration among states 
to address both environmental and economic interests. And she offers her own definition of energy solidarity. She calls it the expression of mutual assistance between states when one of them faces a critical energy supply disruption. It extends to deeper energy co collaboration when states decide to pool their energy resources and integrate their energy systems. Benet underscores the importance of the role of law in promoting energy solidarity. She says it'll only take place among trusted partners and where you have declarations and binding agreements that to contribute to create that required level of trust between states. So she discusses the weaponization of energy in Ukraine war and its impact, resulting in new collaborations between states within and uh, among different regions to ensure the long-term energy supply plurilateralism instead of multilateralism. So she suggests that energy solidarity is stronger when there's a political and market integration, such as in the European Union. But she points out that states will use both market and non-market mechanisms to pursue energy solidarity with a preference for the former. So she says there's a, a tension in these types of solidarities. And the last chapter of the book is by Karen Frude, and she's looking at international solidarity in the digital context. So she talks about the need to promote solidarities that align with human rights and counter those that are discriminatory or unequal through disinform disinformation and hate speech. So she's calling for international solidarity to be non-fixed because solidarities will be constantly made and remade in the digital arena. She talks about this as applying to a range of stakeholders and actors, and um, she wants attention to the, what we call the digital divide, which uh, would include measures such as debt cancellation to enable developing states to access technology. She's super concerned with um, the negative impact of surveillance and the harassment of solidarity activists online. So among her recommendations are to adopt positive and negative obligations to facilitate digital tools and space, as well as pointing out the need to clearly define the tech company's duties in relation to the digital space. So in conclusion, I think the reflections offered in these chapters by these contributors, um, they provide a rich foundation for further research and discussion on both the breadth and the depth of international solidarity in policy and in practice and in institutional and normative development. And I hope we're seeing um, a shift towards a creative new epic in international law.